Well, good morning. Pass your cards inside out. I'll be picked up at this time. Hope everyone is doing well. Hope you all got your uh, extra hour of sleep. Boy, do I really hope that. I'm telling you. Uh, I don't, I can't, well, I, there's only one extra song book up here I can zing at you if you fall asleep, so make sure you're not the one. I think it's a very amazing thing. Uh, I thought about this as we were singing that song. It's a very amazing thing to me that as many times as we fail the Lord every day, billion, some seven billion people around the world, God still looks down upon this world and loves us. As many times as people reject the Heavenly Father, you listen to the news, you're going to get all dejected. Uh, sometimes I'm in the mood to listen to it, sometimes I'm not. You hear about ISIS and how ISIS is doing everything they can to uh, dissuade people from thinking other than they want them to think. Uh, today I heard that there was a, a group from Nigeria that's already killed some 17,000 people that are wanting to band together with ISIS. Now that doesn't make all of Nigeria bad any more than the bad people of Arkansas make all of Arkansas bad. I'm just making a comment here that you look around the world and still our Lord and Savior looks down upon this world and invites all who would to follow Christ in obedience to have a place in an eternal home called heaven. We serve not only a risen Savior, but a God who is so beyond our thoughts, so beyond our analogy, so beyond our arguments, so beyond anything in this world. That that's the only explanation. I was talking with someone this past week, talking about things we understand and things that we don't understand. And I made the statement, and I believe it's as true as can be, that if the Bible says something, even though I don't understand it, it doesn't mean it's not true. Amen? So a lot of times we come across these things, and, and hope is one of those, and we speak about them, about hope, that hope beyond this life is what we must have. Now you look at Scripture, and the Bible just comes out and plainly tells us, it says, we are told not to go beyond that which is written. Now this is a, a direct statement, a direct command to all of us. The Word of God says this, in no uncertain terms, just comes out and says it. John says, 2 John and verse 9, everyone who goes on ahead and does not, underline that, does not abide in the teaching of Christ, does not have God. Now I want you to notice a, a common theme, we'll get back to it here just a little bit later on, a common theme in Scripture. You're going to find everyone, that word's used. You're going to find all who, there's a, an inclusive term that's used, we're going to get to that in a little bit, but notice everyone, including everyone, no one's dismissed from that, who goes ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ, does not have God. An emphatic statement. Something that means it's an imperative to know something about Christ and His teaching. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. Now I want you to notice what it says here. It eliminates a lot of controversy, a lot of arguments. The Bible says it's not enough just to know who Jesus is. It's not enough to stand up and, and to, to cry out to the world, we believe Jesus is a prophet. Not even enough to stand up and say, we believe Jesus is the Son of God. The Bible says we must abide in Him. That is more than this mental assent or mental confirmation that a lot of people want to make, that as long as I believe in Jesus Christ, therefore I have it. But the Bible tells us something quite differently. Now watch. Nobody ever said that leaving this life or leaving our old life would be something that's easy, but we're told to leave the old life behind, including all the guilt, all the bad thing we've done, and to focus on that which is ahead, very familiar part of Scripture. By the way, Harding Academy, I'm pulling for you today, so don't let me down. 
What time do you play? Four o'clock? Okay. I'll be praying for you all afternoon, except for the nap. But here we go. <laughs> Philippians 3, 13 and 14. Brothers, I do not consider, now this is Paul speaking. Brothers, notice who, to whom he's speaking. I do not consider that I have made it my own. He's not perfect yet. But one thing I do, what do you do, Paul? Forgetting what lies behind, if anyone had guilt about the church and what was going on, it'd be the Apostle Paul, right? I forget what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. Paul says, this is a a human battle. The human concept is, hold on to all those bad things. Satan wants us to beat ourselves over the head with it. Hold on to it. All these things in our past. He wants us to be ridiculed. People look at us for us to think we can't accomplish anything. And Paul says, and I I want to use this word, Paul, through the Holy Spirit. Remember, he's inspired by the Holy Spirit to write these things. And for some reason, he uses the word straining forward. That's not an easy task, not anything that's going to be easily accomplished but straining forward to what lies ahead, I, notice the word again, press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul is saying, as a godly man, someone who has received the grace of Jesus, because I've been obedient to His word, I've been baptized, Acts twenty two sixteen. 16, have my sins washed away. I want to tell you, if I lived in the past, it's going to swallow me up. If my focus is on the bad things I've always done, if I believe that coming to God, that I'm going to be judged and I'm going to be the sum total of only my past disgraces, then what's the use? Paul was saying, God has more in store for us. He wants us to have a hope that goes beyond this life. Amos 4 and verse 12. I used to see these signs whenever I was uh, at Harding University way back in 1974 and had my first preaching job. I told you about that. My first preaching job was at at a place called Sulphur Rock, right outside of Batesville, about 10 miles. It was a 60-mile trip to get there from Harding, from the new married student apartments then. 60 miles, 120 mile round trip. (sighs) But I had my first preaching job as a student because they required that of us at the Harding School of Biblical Studies. And my first preaching job every Lord's Day, 120 mile round trip, and I made $5 a week. And they overpaid me at that, I'll guarantee you. After I was there about Oh, three months or so, they raised my salary. I was in big time. Now I'm making $15 a week. I was a professional right there, boy, I'm telling you. Professional gospel preacher, $15 a week. I see that sign going up there every single Lord's Day on the side of the road. And it makes you ask the question, or it does me, does the Bible ever tell us exactly where God wants us to be, why we live on this earth and serving Him? Where does he want us? What does he want us to be doing? And I am convinced whenever you look at the word of God and and get deeply into it, that we all know that we cannot as Christians involve ourselves in those things that are not ordained by scripture. Now we all know that whether we live by it or not is another story, but we all know that. Amen. No church didn't hear me. Amen. We, We all know that. And so we we come to the conclusion, I believe the Bible, or I do, I believe the Bible teaches that God wants us to be in a constant state of preparation for the life beyond this life. Heard one lady say one time, Brother Jack, I just don't know why there has to be singing in heaven. I just don't like singing. (laughs) Uh, You will, I'll guarantee you. Uh, It beats the alternative. I had one person talking to me, and, and you know, I've told you this before, one lady, and this goes back to the naivete of some members of the Lord's body that hold on to fictitious teaching. Whenever, I remember whenever the, uh, the African-American congregation 
over in Malvern at the Fifth and Oak Congregation and the North Main Congregation. I was there. I was a part of it. Where you had a black congregation and a white congregation that merged together. Under one common bond to serve the one God that we serve, realizing we're all people of God. Right? So there we are. One lady came up to me and she said, she didn't like it a whole lot because she held on to that, but she finally gave in. She said to me, he said, Brother Jack, you know, that concerned look, furled brow. Brother Jack, I guess, I guess if we can't get along with them down here, we'll get along with them up there. I wanted to step back. I looked at her and I told her, I've, I've told you this before, I promise, I looked her in the eye and I said, ma'am, if you can't get along with them down here, you might as well get fitted for an asbestos suit because you're not going to make it up there. She looked at me as though I were crazy. But that's the reality, is it not? You need to be in a constant state of preparing for what's to come. And sometimes we don't take all the ramifications of what that means. That means in God's heaven, you listening to me? There'll be men and women, right? Now, not we're all going to be changed just from this earth, what I'm talking about. People, hopefully and prayerfully, of every race, every color, every nation. Those are who God has invited. And part of our preparation for life beyond this life is recognizing that fact and seeing all human beings for exactly what they are. Someone that's in need of the blood of Jesus. And that's where we go to. Obedience to God, I believe, is an expression of our love for Him. And uh, it's, the only, it's the only thing I have to offer to God that tells Him how much I care. I can mouth the words all I want to, and it doesn't mean a thing. It's kind of like we've talked about before, where the man said, I told my wife when I married her, I loved her. If I change my mind, I'll let her know. It doesn't work that way. It just doesn't work that way. That's a lonely man that lives that kind of life. But you see, we come to the Word of God, and our expression, they were having a problem at Corinth, a lot of problems, one of their problems happened to be about the resurrection, whether it was real. Is there really life? You know, it's like Job said in Job 14 and verse 14. Is there life after death? And it's puzzled people all along, and Paul wants to put it to rest. Again, guided by the Holy Spirit. He says, for if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. You see that? And if Christ has not been raised, watch, your faith is vain, futile, empty. And you are still in your sins. It all focuses on the death, burial, resurrection of Christ. And the point he is saying here, if Jesus Christ has not been raised from the dead, we all better convert to Judaism, to being a Jewish people, a Jewish country. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. They have no hope. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, I'll get to that in a second, we are of all people most to be pitied. Then he goes on to say, in the next part of that, next few scriptures, verses 22 through 22, but in fact, he says, this is irrefutable evidence coming through the Holy Spirit, inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Paul says, but in fact, this is a conclusionary fact, something that's just, you, you can't, Argue against it, you can, but you're going to be wrong. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. But as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. Now watch carefully verse 22, and I'll get to a point I've said from this pulpit many, many times. It goes with Hebrews 9 and verse 15. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all, you see it, be made alive. Who's the all? No one's excluded. You've heard me say, the blood of Jesus paid that debt because He is, as Carl said, the Lamb of God, that perfect sacrifice. 
Hebrews 9.15 says when he died, he died for those under the old law. It goes back even farther than that. The scripture says, also in Christ shall all be made alive. All the way back from Adam and Eve, all the way to the last person being saved on this earth. How is that possible? Because of that one great sacrifice. The Bible tells us, 1 Timothy 2 and verse 5, that there is one mediator between God and man. That man Christ. Jesus Christ. He is the mediator, our go-between. He who is going to plead our case. That we stand at judgment. John 5, 22, be judged by Jesus. John 12, 48, being judged by the Word. But we stand there at judgment as people that do not deserve anything. You listening to me? Amen. But we stand there as people that need the grace of God and because of the sacrifice of Jesus, we get it. That's why Romans 8 and verse 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation of those who are in Christ Jesus. What does it mean? Because we have contacted the blood of Christ through our baptism into Christ. That now we can have that promised new life, Romans 6, 3 and 4. We have that new birth, John 3, verses 3 through 5. Now you watch as we go on. I only have another I guess you have no choice but to watch. Do you? Verse 9 plainly states that if we only have hope in this life, we are to be the most pitied people on earth. You know why that is? If we living in this life thinking living the Christian life is only for here and we're not sure about what lies beyond and we don't know if there is what lies. Well, listen, why is this true? Why is it? Well, because we are living and perpetuating a lie if Jesus, was, Jesus wasn't raised from the dead. That's what Paul's saying. Paul is admitting here one central fact, one central theme. All of Christianity, the doctrine of the church, our salvation, grace, how we worship that's different from the old law. Everything is predicated upon the one fact of whether Jesus Christ died, was buried, and rose again. If that is not true, then we are to be pitied because we're perpetuating a lie and we're causing all people around the world to be lost that we bring to the Lord. You see, that's why we talk about, some people say that, that <laughs> Jesus was a good man, but not the Son of God, and we've talked about that ad nauseum. You know, uh, and I have told you, as other preachers have mentioned many, many times, I got it from them in gospel meetings, Jesus was either Lord, liar, or lunatic. Those are the three possibilities. Don't tell me he's a good man if he wasn't what he said he was because he's causing millions, if not billions of people throughout the world, throughout time, to lose their very soul. Jesus is either a Lord, our Lord, He's a liar or he's a lunatic. I believe he's Lord. And so we look at this and we go on. As Christians, we believe that anyone who will be made alive in the life to come will be made alive only by Christ Jesus. And as I've said so many times, it doesn't matter what Oprah says or anybody else that tries to tell you there's more than one way. There isn't more than one way. We know this because Jesus stated it as fact. Whenever he made this statement, you read it before many times, Jesus said to him, watch this recurring theme. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Notice, no one. That goes all the way back as far as you want to go. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now have all these celebrities that people idolize, that stand up and want to tell you what you should believe, what is true, and they sound intelligent until they open their mouths for long. Want to tell you how the world should be run, tell you about morality, and all these different things when the reality is a lot of times not their reality. Amen? Amen? Because the Bible, I don't care how many ways you cut it, the Bible says Jesus is the only way. 
That's it. There isn't any other. You can't water it down. Looking around the world, we can see millions upon millions of people trying to live their lives to get ahead in order to provide for the best for their families and for their loved ones. And they should be. 1 Timothy 5 and verse 8 tells us we need to provide for our own, take care of our own, especially those of our own family. And if we don't, we're worse than a non-believer, an infidel, atheist, any way you want to cut that. So we understand that, but part of that taking care of them is not only giving them a great education and feeding them and clothing them and giving them shelter, but the most never figure out that the best life you can give someone is living for Jesus. I don't know how many people I've heard over the past 40 years of preaching that have sat down in my office and their parents have gone on and they're sitting there and tears are flowing out of their eyes, of course. They look at me and they say, Brother Jack, I just, I, I just, can't, I just can't believe the way I used to be. And their story, although it varies down different roads and different, you know, incremental things that happen in their lives along the way, the basic concept is the same. Brother Jack, I was raised in the church by godly parents. They loved me so much, they believed they were, every time the doors were open, they were there at services. I didn't see rampant inconsistency in their lives. They were the examples they were supposed to be, but somehow, some way, I, and boy, they really hone in on that, I made the decision to walk away from God and to disappoint them. And more importantly, to disappoint my Heavenly Father. But I've come back. And I'm doing what God would have me to do. I wish I'd have done it sooner. And I tell them, the important thing is, you have come back. Drop the guilt. If your parents could talk to you now, I promise you, they would be heaping accolades on you and wanting to embrace you and hug you that all of us in this life have made mistakes. But we have to come to the realization, for some it's later on in life, for some it's sooner. But it's just like that example of the, the two candles that are brought into a pulpit. One candle is about this high and, and lit and burning. Another candle is about that high and lit and burning. And the, the preacher made the comment, he said, I want you to notice both candles. One's longer than the other one. The, the taller one, the longer one. It represents those who are obedient to God at a younger age and stay obedient to God. That light undoubtedly shines longer. The shorter one is representative of those people who come to the Lord later on. It undoubtedly shines for a less time. But I'll promise all of you in the audience, if you were to come up here and stick your hand over both flames, it's going to burn just as much. It's going to be just as hot. So the main theme of this is, whether or not at some point in our lives, we awaken to the idea who God is, that there is hope beyond this life, that regardless of how badly this world seems to be to us, there is still a Heavenly Father that has to be served. There is still the sacrifice of His Son. And regardless of how long your light will burn, the important thing is that it burns and that we serve Him. So there we go. You had a perfect chance to say amen there, church. You're going to catch on. Next 29 years, you'll catch on. Jesus said, I am the door. Watch again. Here we go, that common theme. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly or more abundantly. Begs the question, what makes a life with Jesus such an abundant life? Well, 
I'll believe it's because if we live for Jesus Christ, we've tapped into the greatest power that exists in this world. Well, we're obedient to the Lord, and I, I, I want us to get this today, if we haven't gotten it already. That act of obedience... See, around the world today, there are going to be people that are preaching falsely that we join something. That we need to to join the church. We need to be part of this. And in a lot of places around the world today, when someone comes forward, when people do come forward, to join that congregation, there will be a vote extended on whether or not they want them. I don't know if you knew that or not. Maybe you did, maybe you didn't. I'm not talking about the churches of Christ, talking about in the denominational world. That's going to be something that is done. The Bible that I read, and check and see if this isn't true, but the Bible that I read and that you read tells us about what God does whenever we are obedient to Him. We have to hear the Word of God, Romans 10 and verse 17. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. We have to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, John 8 and verse 24. Unless you believe that I am He, you shall die in your sins. We must repent of our sins, Luke 13 and verse 3 through 5, verses 3 through 5. We must confess with the mouth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, Romans 10, 9 and 10, Matthew 10, 32 and 33. We must be baptized into Christ to have our sins washed away because it is there that we've contacted His blood through our obedience. Then after that, we must stay true to His Word, 1 John 2 and verse 6 and other places. But the beauty of that is that when we are obedient to those steps, we call them five steps, five-step plan of salvation, then here's what God does. God makes sure because we contact the blood, our sins are washed away. We receive the grace that God would have us to have. We receive the the gift of the Holy Spirit, whatever that gift is, that's debatable, but I believe the Holy Spirit dwells in us through the Word, but that's another sermon another time. And the Bible says, Acts 2 and verse 47, because of that obedience, we're added to the church. Notice, we don't join anything. God knows who are His and who isn't. So God adds us to that. Also notice, nowhere in Scripture is it ever taught that we have a right to vote on whether or not someone gets in or gets out. You know, to me, that's one of the most haughty doctrines of all. Boastful, prideful. Now you think about this because... The same people that practice that believe that the person is saved because they've accepted Jesus as their personal Savior. But they're voting on whether or not they're good enough to be at their congregation. So they're good enough for heaven, but not good enough for that congregation. I think God's Word teaches otherwise. If you are a saved person, you're part of the Lord's family regardless. Another chance to say amen, but you just missed it again. I'm going to just have to have me some cue cards up here. and There we go. Give me another couple minutes and we're going to close today's lesson. But I wanted to really get to this. Okay. I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for His name's sake. I'm writing to you, fathers. I want you to notice how he mentions, you know, little children, fathers, young men, and then goes re- it's repetition goes back over the same thing. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Now, I won't, the next part of this is, well, talking about the... Um, Lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the boastful pride of life, and how we're not supposed to avail ourselves of such things. 
And do not love the world or the things of the world. That means any, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.22 says abstain for every appearance of evil. Uh, we know even going down to 1 Corinthians 15.33, evil companionship corrupts good morals. We know all of these different things concerning that. But I want to close with the idea that Jesus is our hope and what that means. How do we press on toward uh, hope beyond this life? Well, I think there are many steps, and I'm going to end with this slide, sound room, okay? Number one, in an acrostic, if you will, we need to honor God through our lives and worship. That's why it's so important that we get this proskuneo, this bowing before God in the Greek, this being reverent and respectful and worship God the way God would have us to worship. We have to get that right. Another way we press on, offer hope to those without Christ. Very, very important thing that we don't hoard Christ. We don't try to just be, you know, uh, somebody that says you can have it and you can't. But we're open to teach by our very lives and by our very words about Jesus Christ. Press on towards spiritual maturity. Don't settle for where you are now in Christ and your knowledge now, regardless of where that is. Strive to learn more. I've told you for years, the more that I study the Word of God, the more I know that I don't know. So it's a lifelong process, studying the Word of God. It is for me, and I think it is for everyone. Encourage the brethren in their Christian walk. One of the most important aspects in all of Christianity that we cannot neglect. There may be someone here today that is yet to say yes to the invitation that God has given to the world. To be obedient, to be baptized into, into Christ. To be raised with Him to walk in that newness of life. Notice as I often say, without the baptism and without being united with Him and being raised with Him, there is no newness of life, meaning you're still in your old life. If you have a need for repentance, for prayer, whatever it might be, won't you come as we stand and sing?